Hello there. Uh, this time I'm going to read something to you. I'm going to dive into some philosophical matters. So normally I would try to speech it on the fly or I would uh, do a voiceover, but now I really have to uh, stick with the text because it's a bit complicated, but very meaningful. In 1976, a German magazine called Der Spiegel asked Martin Heidegger, a famous philosopher, uh, whether he believed the Germans possessed a specific qualification for bringing about a reversal of modern technology, or as we say, a revolt against the modern world. Heidegger feared that technology might one day become humanity's master, and since by the early 20th century, Germany had become the most technologically advanced nation, Germans should now also be made responsible for putting an end to the technological optimism. Heidegger thought it was a naive frame to continue professing this idea that technology will solve all of our problems someday. It won't. And to prevent the destruction of the world, as though the whole planet were a giant gas station, we must reverse the technological trend. And this reversal then can only be brought about by the same people that perfected that trend. By applying new thinking and by drawing that thinking from the sources found in European tradition, we can give birth to a new post-technological era. So in the interview with Der Spiegel, Heidegger added this, he said, I am thinking of the special inner relationship between the German language and the language and thinking of the Greeks the ancient Greeks. This has been confirmed to me again and again today by the French, French philosophers. When they begin to think, they speak German. They insist that they could not get through with their own language because they see that they cannot get through to today's world with all their rationality when it comes down to understanding the world in the source of its being. So what Heidegger was suggesting here is that German and Greek languages are much more rooted in their traditional past than our French or even Latin. And that for this reason, German is a superior tool to philosophize in and not French or English. French and Latin serve the scientific bureaucracy well, but cannot grasp the essence of being to which one must return in order to overcome technology. Uh, Heidegger's claim has often been dismissed by detractors, even ridiculed by some who saw in Heidegger a, a chauvinist or a nationalist, uh, as though he only claimed that uh, German language was superior because it was German. But upon closer inspection, we find that Heidegger was right. German language is a superior choice for the art of thinking, poetizing and philosophizing. The rootedness of even modern German helps a German speaker understand his own language in ways that a speaker of English cannot. And I'm going to go into that in this article. Take, for example, the word reality. What is reality? What does the English word for reality mean? Can you use your English language alone to try to figure out what is considered real and what is not? Now, an English speaker would be able to make out that the word reality refers to all the things that are real, but there it stops. What things are real then? Right? The English speaker with his knowledge of English language cannot determine, cannot decide what he is supposed to regard as real or not. So the question remains unanswered. An English speaker is forced to first study Latin and French in order to find the answers to life's questions. Etymology, which is the study of the origin and the development of words, learns that by the year 1550 in England, the word reality was originally coined as a legal term that meant fixed property. In other words, real estate. Reality in English is real estate. English reality is a sort of real estate which includes houses, bridges, roads, infrastructure, farmland, landscapes, and perhaps the earth and the stars too, but always physical. English reality um, centers around the material physical aspects of reality. 
only by the year 1647 did the word reality come to mean real existence, but the older meaning of real estate still lies buried in this phrase, meaning that real existence still means physical existence. It includes people, people as physical bodies, not as beings. The spiritual dimension of our universe is simply not considered part of the English idea of reality, only the material. English reality is a strictly objective one. Germans, however, occupy a completely different reality. A German speaker would notice, for example, that the word for reality, which is Wirklichkeit, contains the stem, wirk, of the verb wirken. Wirken can be translated into English as simply to work, as in the engine is working or I am going to work. Though in German, the verb wirken has many more meanings. And this is where we get at the crux of the matter. Wirken can also mean to appear or to seem. It can mean to achieve some effect or to cause something to happen, uh, perhaps by casting a spell such as the solution works miracles. It can also mean for something to take effect as in the new law is effective immediately, i.e. the law is put to work. If we take this verb wirken to mean to work in English, then wirklichkeit could be translated a bit more literally as meaning workingness. German wirklichkeit is workingness. English reality, so whereas reality in English is static and objective, Workingness in German means to be at work, to, um, to be something active yet subjective. So in perfect opposition to English objective reality, German Wirklichkeit refers to all the things that an English speaker would not consider real. Wirklichkeit entails forces, spirits, souls, the doings of deeds, actions, if in English reality, the physical object that is a chair is considered real, in German Wirklichkeit it is rather the imaginative spirit whose forces were applied to the untreated wood that is real. The chair itself is an object, a Gegenstand, but it's not considered real. It is rather more uh, an appearance of reality rather than physical. The effect of working untreated wood is the workingness of the Germans that results into a chair, whereas in English a chair is in itself a physical object that is considered real. In German then, a physical object in itself does not exist at all. Physical objects are not part of German reality, but rather the results thereof, implying there must have been a force at work that created the objects. In German Wirklichkeit, as with Dutch Werklichkeit or Swedish Werklichkeit, realities are the imprint creative actions have left behind in the form of works. German reality is all the things that appear to have an effect on something else, not just by and of machines, but rather of life, of nature, of the universe, of souls and human beings, and specifically of God. For what is really meant with Wirklichkeit is the effect God's actions have on the world or on people who are being worked on by God. In this sense, today's Germans and Germanic peoples in general are still more religious than modern day Englishmen despite their Germanic uh, heritage. But Englishmen didn't always refer to their workingness, their reality, as objective and material. Their ancestors, the speakers of Old English, of Anglo-Saxon, held a view of reality more similar to that of the Germans. The Anglo peoples did not think of their world as a soulless physical object, as mere possession devoid of an inner working. The Anglo-Saxon or Old English people had a word for reality and it used to be Erwesung, if I pronounce that correctly. This word stems from the, ver from the verb Wesen, which can be translated as to be. But actually their word Wesen has a more precise meaning of being present, to be present. Uh, 
In fact, in modern German language, there is an expression uh, anwesend sein, which means to be present, Erwesung. The German Wesen can also mean a being, such as ein menschliches Wesen, which means a human being. The Anglo-Saxon word Erwesung is a bit more precise, meaning that merely being present isn't enough. It becomes clear when we ask the following questions. What are we present for? Uh, for whom? And for how long? <laughs> the Anglo-Saxon would have instinctively understood that Erwesung means the being present forever. We are facing an eternal and continuous being present. Now imagine it this way. Imagine you're in a classroom and the lecturer asks about a Mr. Smith. Is Mr. Smith present? So the lecturer looks around until Mr. Smith raises his hand and says, I'm, I'm, yes, sir, I'm present. So what does that really mean to be present in this context? Uh, this unwesend sein. It means you are not only there, but you also intend to stay there for the remainder of the lecture. You are present for the whole lecture. And you are not merely there for no reason. You are there to be in the presence of the lecturer from whom you wish to learn something. The lecturer is going to teach you something. He's going to have an effect on you. He's going to, to work on your mind. This implies that, like the German Anwesen or Anwesend sein, the Anglo-Saxon Erwesung implies an eternal being present for, for some higher power. Anglo-Saxon reality, Erwesung, means all the things eternally being present for God, in whose presence everything exists. And this obviously excludes the physical reality altogether. Rather, the indestructible souls of men passing through the ages are the things considered eternally being present for God, reality. In other words, we are here for a reason, say the Anglo-Saxon, and there is more to existence than mere physical reality, as the English now say. So we learn from all this that reality is not at all objective. Reality is subjective. And different peoples, speaking different languages, living in different times and, and places, hold completely different views of what is or isn't real. It means that reality must first be defined by people. And the very act of defining reality gives rise to a people's worldview. Modern-day Englishmen have come to see themselves as bodies in motion, whereas the ancient Anglo-Saxons saw themselves as eternal spirits there to live in the presence of God. Latin-speaking Romans and later French-speaking Normans really murdered the English soul by forcing the Anglo people to adopt a strictly material sense of reality, the objective real estate. Germans, of course, beat the Roman Empire at the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, and this event saved their language from Romanization. It is why Germans still speak their own language, and why the French, the Celtic peoples, have come to speak a form of Latin, like the Spaniards. It is a Latinized, Romanized language. They lost their own language. It is no wonder, then, that modern English language the language of the Anglo people who have been subdued by the Romans, has become the language of the scientific community and of academia, modern academia, not the Greek one. These are branches of human life now completely devoid of any spirit. German Wirklichkeit, on the other hand, the workingness of it all, is about the forces acting on us and around us. One could say Wirklichkeit is the inner working of minds and souls, the divine power that flows through us and around us, and with us and beyond us. Forces that take effect on us, on our thinking and on our behavior. German Wirklichkeit is the sum of the souls and spirits of the subjective. And so, to the Anglo-Saxon, whose conception of reality was arguably even more spiritual than that of German Wirklichkeit, their reality was all about an eternally being present, or a continuous being present for something or someone, namely, as they would have understood,
God, the Anglo-Saxon would have seen themselves as existing for God in the presence of a God from whom they wish to learn something. And so I conclude that Martin Heidegger was right. German language really is superior to English when it comes to philosophizing, mind you, because in the same breath we can say that modern English has developed into the superior language for dealing with scientific research, for the material world. This is the material science that looks at things and objects and how they move. But it does not ask what movement is, because science cannot use its own scientific methods to figure out what movement is, or what time is, or what space is. Only philosophy can. So if you want to know what reality is, ask a German. If you want to know how fast things are moving, ask an Englishman. Now, if someday English speakers finally get fed up with material society, then perhaps they won't have to learn to speak German to rediscover their long-lost souls. But rather, they can return to the language of their Anglo-Saxon forebears. Language being an expression of how we think, if the English-speaking peoples were to take a greater interest in the old vocabularies, in the old words of their ancestors, and in doing so rekindle their people's connection to and with God and with subjective reality, they might beat the Germans to bringing about a revolt against the modern world.